Hi everyone, welcome back to the Internet Reports Pulse Update, the bi-weekly podcast where we keep our finger on the pulse of how the internet is holding up week over week. This week, we're discussing a range of issues, including a recent AT&T outage and other disruptions at several Australian banks, Google Cloud, Front and Minnesota State University. I'm Barry Collins, and I'll be hosting today with the amazing Mike Hicks, Principal Solutions Analyst at Thousand Eyes. As always, we've included chapters in the episode description below, so you can skip ahead to the sections that are most interesting to you. And if you haven't already, we'd love you to take a moment to like and subscribe. For all our YouTube listeners, don't forget that we also release the show on all the major podcast platforms, so feel free to give us a follow over at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you like to listen. Let's crack on with the show, and I started by asking Mike to explain what some AT&T customers experienced when the cellular network suffered an outage on February 22nd. When the users actually tried to use their cellular connections, so the connection to the cell towers, they were just getting SOS. So that meant they actually couldn't sort of connect into any other back networks there. When we actually looked at sort of the backbone itself, we could see that the whole AT&T backbones up. But what just appeared to be a disconnect, as it were, was that connection as you came from that cellular network to then sort of that handoff into the IP network, the backbone to transport the information. Does this case highlight the importance of knowing where a fault occurred in your delivery chain, making remediation easier? Yeah, it, it does, absolutely, Barry, because what we're looking at here is if all of a sudden I don't have any connectivity and we're trying to sort of work out what's going on. So if I understand sort of the, the parts of it, and as I said, that backbone was actually up. It was actually sort of passing IP traffic. As it transpired, not all the subscriber base was impacted. Uh, you know, So we got that from anecdotal evidence and actually sp- speaking to people that some people could additionally still had their connectivity. But if I can actually identify the components involved in that chain, then exactly right. I can actually make sort of suggestions and remediation recommendations of what you do. And in fact, one of the remediation recommendations that was coming out from AT&T was if you have a alternate Wi-Fi connectivity, then basically you could go to Wi-Fi calling, which meant then that you could take your cellular data straight over that, that Wi-Fi network there. By identifying those components, that service delivery chain, we can break down it and we can say, this is what you do, but also then sort of help to work out where you're going to uh, troubleshoot. Given that most major outages are typically the result of an internal error, should that change how we think about mitigation? Yeah, it should really. And let's sort of just take a step back from there. So at have actually said that this appears to be the result of a error that occurred during a process and during some of their planned expansion work. So if we also look at the time of day that was first notified, it was sort of at 3.30 a.m. in the morning. So therefore, that is indicative of some sort of scheduled work or some sort of planned work going across there. So there's two elements of this. One, you know you're going to do that, but you don't always know what's going to happen. You don't necessarily know the effect. You can plan, you can do simulations and emulations to understand what, what's potentially happened. But also what you need to do is to be aware of these changes are going on. And therefore, then if you're aware of what's happening in that complete service delivery chain, the components involved, you can do a couple of things. One, you can actually take these steps to remediate. Okay, we know we've made a change here. Is it easy to roll back? Yeah. So again, we're sort of looking at, and again, it's not necessarily always easy. It depends what change had taken place, what sort of software. But again, remember, we're dealing with people and process. We've moved out of this automation phase to a degree. And although some systems may kick in, we, we've actually got these, these people involved. But, but once we've actually done that, we can take steps. We know a change was done here. And we also know then this impacted sort of this component off here or this area down here. So therefore, we can start to focus on those areas as well. But we do know that at some point, we actually made this change and so therefore we can do it. It all comes back to this awareness. If I understand my service delivery chain, as we're always saying, then I can understand sort of, you know, how changes impact it and take those lessons and learn for the future. You know, is there something we could have done the next stage? So the way that this appeared to propagate, sort of appeared to propagate to hit multiple regions. So therefore, you know, we're saying, okay, it looked like it was some sort of software thing. Again, as I said, it was a process error there. But is there something we could have done? Could we have done a stage rollout for those those systems? I don't know if that's the case, but understanding how it impacted in conjunction with the service delivery, then you can sort of take steps the next time um, to try and reduce any impacts. Our next outage saw several Australian banks all affected by the same issue. I asked our resident Australian to explain what went awry. So there are a number of banks, uh, including Ubank, Bank Australia, Defence Bank, Beyond Bank, People's Choice, Police and Nurses Bank, that experienced this outage, right? And it manifested itself to the customers in like a loss of access to the banking apps. So they could actually connect to the system, but when they tried to do transfers, look at particular systems there, they couldn't do it. Now, 
what it turns out to be or what that, that looks to us to do when we look from the outside is we can actually see then, okay, we know we can get to the front door. So we know we can get to the bank. We know we can get to the application. We can actually even start to do the transaction, but everything just hangs. You know, I can't go to that next stage. So therefore, that tells us that's something outside. That's this sort of third-party system that's actually involved in doing the transfer to there. Some sort of common aggregation point. Now, we're talking about this single aggregation point that has this situation where you need to, to everything needs to go through it. And this is what turned out to be here. So, so Data Action, who are a provider of core services and internet app-based banking, said they had a, an issue, a network outage on its end. So it, it had a series of incidences and it actually logged this sort of leading up to it. But what it meant was because I had this network outage, again, I couldn't actually connect to it. Therefore, I couldn't go on to the next stage. So I couldn't transfer. Now, the interesting thing about this, or one of the interesting things about this was the brand damage essentially to these banks. So because we couldn't do the transfer, people couldn't get paid, they couldn't pay bills, they were the ones that sort of took the brunt of it, where it was this sort of third party uh, system in the back end that was a problem. Now, now where that becomes interesting, obviously from that brand control, nobody's going to go out there and say it wasn't us, it was them and sort of point the finger. But, but from, a, from a responsibility perspective, if they understood or once you understand that, again, that service delivery chain, you straight away under, identify here where it is. So when we do get the complaints, you can say, yep. We know there's an issue. We're actually working to resolve it. It's with a third-party provider or, or whatever it is down to that point. We've talked in the past about how shared infrastructure can cause multiple problems. And this is another example of that. Is this something these banks need to guard against? Absolutely. So... As we said, we talked about this this common infrastructure. There's already sort of regulations coming in. And if we look at Europe in 2025, they're going to introduce DORA. DORA, for those not familiar with the term, is the EU's Digital Operations Resilience Act, which comes into effect in January. And there's a very specific section in that that says financial institutions have to be aware of these third-party providers. Not that they're just using them, but they need to, be to understand. Essentially, it's sort of talking about breaches and this type of thing. But it does come back then to a performance. Do I need to know where it's going, how it's connecting, what's performing from it? So you need to be aware of it. Obviously, you don't control it. You have no way of instrumenting that. So I need to have some way of actually having visibility because it is part of my overall service delivery. And as I mentioned previously, it also then comes down to how is that going to reflect in my brand? Nobody cares that it's a back-end system. All they see is that it was you that was down. It's been another busy fortnight of disruptions for Mike to monitor, so we're going to round up some of the notable problems that have come across his radar. Let's start with Google. So on February 14th, uh, Google Cloud customers in its US1 region experienced this sporadic disruption due to a regional metadata store in that location. Now, a metadata store is essentially a, a store where we're going to put information pertinent to the data, so indicating what the data is in there. So it could be location, could be object ID, could all this type of thing. Now, it's actually heavily used within sort of AI ML because obviously we're looking at large amounts of data and then we um, need to, to actually store that together. So Google explained then that the uh, this actual metadata store uh, supported sort of critical functions such as servicing the customer requests, as I said, handling scale and load balancing. And this is essentially where we had the issues there. Because it actually handles the load balancing and it auto scales, you know, we're talking about large volumes of data here. We need to sort of scale up to keep pace with the metadata requests. They actually had an unexpected sort of spike in demand, which exceeded the uh, system's ability to quickly provision. So it couldn't scale up. It couldn't spin up another instance. As a result, what happened then was there's sort of multiple services to rely on this metadata store to actually pull the information back. Think of it like a large database where we're sort of looking at indexing to pull things back within that region. What they saw was elevated latencies and errors until the actual sort of load was isolated. Google said in a, in a sort of post-incident report that there was a large number of uh, AI and uh, machine learning based services that were actually impacted. Front also suffered some recent disruption. So Front's a collaboration and workflow automation service provider. Now they had a disruption on February the 18th due to what they say was a large unexpected increase in web traffic. Now this disruption manifested itself to users as problems loading the applications so they couldn't actually get there. From a thousand eyes perspective, we observed that it was indeed an increase in load. We could see the increase in load coming up in the steps. Now, looking at the timing of this, it was actually a Sunday in the US. Now, the increase in traffic did not appear to have been anything nefarious in nature. So it didn't look like it was coming from the outside. Instead, it might have been some sort of a result of some sort of race condition caught on by some software change or patch applied internally. 
Now, we put those two together. So we say this was out of hours. This was a Sunday evening. There was something going on. This large increase in traffic occurred. As I said, if we actually look for everything coming in, you couldn't see sort of signs or symptoms of something coming from the outside from there. So it was definitely low related uh, because we saw this nice castellation effect in terms of load. But as I said, it looked like it was sort of just almost self-generating its information. Box customers also had difficulty reaching their files for a period recently. Over to Mike to explain what went wrong here. Box is a cloud storage and collaboration service. There was users had problems sort of unable to log in for about 30 minutes. Now, this actually occurred on February the 14th. So from a thousand perspective, we observed some errors and timeouts when sort of trying to access the system, indicating the network connectivity to the Box's front door was actually fine, but it looked like some sort of back-end problem existed. So again, as you tend to log on to go to the system, you can't go any further. A preliminary post incident report, Box actually confirmed that there was indeed a backend issue on a third-party hosted component that was actually powering part of the single sign-on process. So this is the element where we go. So we've actually gone there. I'm logging on. I want some sort of single sign-on. I need to go to this third party to authenticate before I can get back on. If I can't authenticate, can't go any further. Now, because of this sort of failure between the underlying network component and one of Box's third-party providers, people couldn't actually log on there. Uh, and it was actually then resolved when the service provider addressed the issue. And we're going to wrap up this mini roundup with Minnesota State University Moorhead, who provided some of a case study on how to deal with a cyber attack and the power of visibility. This is actually an interesting one. So on February the 1st, the IT teams at Minnesota State University observed some of their server infrastructure wasn't actually performing as, as expected. So they initially suspected a network fault, as you always do. They started to look through to it. But to take control of the situation, they actually proactively took the servers and networks and systems offline to troubleshoot. When they did this, they actually found that there was some sort of cyber attack had gone on. So they were very good. They sort of took things down and then they actually went through and cleaned this service. And as the networks have progressively switched back on, a process then sort of led to the, the uh, discoveries, this infection on the handful of servers. What Mike really liked about this case was how it illustrated good observability. He compared it to the early warning system for earthquakes. We think of you know earthquakes looking at sort of the seismic tremors coming up as some sort of pre-warning. This is essentially, this is really good because there was some sort of this sluggish in the server, this server to respond, something wasn't right, something wasn't right with that picture. Then sort of breaking down the components to understand what it was, they were able to then bring that down to here and limit the, the impact. And so they could sort of take things offline while they cleaned things down there. So it was really good. Now we head into the part of the show where we monitor the outage figures for the past fortnight. What's Mike noticed in the recent worldwide numbers? So we've got now into February, we're well into February there. So after a slight increase at the start of February, where we saw those numbers sort of jump up, the rest of February is it's actually decreased right through that month there. So during the week of February 12th to 18th, we actually saw a drop from 319243. It's like a 23% decrease. And again, then another step of 32% the following week. If I look then at the US, it was very similar. Uh, the, the, the decreases were slightly smaller or, or much smaller, I should say. Sort of we had 91 to 90, which is only a 1% drop compared to that previous week. Before, again, it decreased then sort of in line with everything else, which around 34% that following week. So that week of uh, February 19th to 25th. With the benefit of hindsight, Mike, would you say that surge of outages we saw at the beginning of February was just an anomaly? Yeah, yeah, it appeared to be a blip. And as we, we talked about in the last episode, you know, we could attribute this to some sort of cloud provider outages uh, or work going on in APJC region. So that sort of large number was somewhat inflated. So yeah, absolutely a blip. You know, again, we, we talked about this. We, we, we have this drop as we come out of the holiday season and then we start coming up slowly in January and then we'll sort of go down again as we're coming into sort of almost another type of holiday period to, to a degree there. And you know, this was reflected when I actually look at the outage pattern that I saw over the week. I sort of, you know, saw a few blips and every now and again, but they were sort of quite small durations, which is almost indicative of some sort of automated process. You know, I'm looking at sort of it's, it's an interface goes down for a two minutes a time, and then it restores, and it might go down again, then it might restore. But in that meantime, something else will switch over. So yeah, looks like anomaly at the start of the month there until we've actually sort of gone into a normal trend coming down. And the last part that I want to sort of cover with these numbers then was, you know, it was kind of in, uh, reflective of the fact we saw this large rise, then we saw the CISO decrease there, was, was the percentage of uh, outages that were attributed to sort of US-centric devices uh, or US-centric networks there. So during this period, you know, this, this 
uh, we're talking about now, the February 12th to 25th, there was only 37% of all of the outages we observed were actually based in the US. Now, this is the second consecutive two-week period where the US-centric outages have accounted for less than 40%. This is interesting because it's been almost a year since we've seen two consecutive periods of less than 40%. We talked about this previously that when I was back in 2022, I was averaging around sort of 34% for that year. Last year, it sort of rose up to sort of 37, 38%. But the bulk of that year was actually flowing through over 40%. This is this first return from there. So it'd be interesting to see sort of how this evolves coming out on this. That's our show. We'd really appreciate it if you click like and subscribe. Not only does this ensure you're the first to know when a new episode is published, it also helps us to shape the show for you. You can follow us on X at at Thousand Eyes or send questions and feedback to internetreport at thousandeyes.com. Until next time, goodbye.